Hi, my name is Pete Bauer, and this is the uh, sermon for Peace Hill Christian Fellowship for August 23rd, 2020. Uh, we are preaching through the book of James, and this morning I am preaching on James chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. I want to begin by reading uh, that passage to you. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God tempt anyone. But each one is tempted, when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear friends. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the words of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, with the, the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be all that you desire them to be. Open our minds and our spirits to what your spirit wants to say to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, James began this letter talking about uh, suffering and trials and these verses begin with that same idea of uh, persevering under trial. But then in, in these verses, uh, this idea quickly turns uh, to the question of facing temptation. Um, and it might be helpful to you to know that the word for trial and the word for temptation are, are both the same word in, in the Greek. Um, I won't say it because I'll probably pronounce it wrong. Um, However, it's, it's probably good for us to know that. Um, trial and temptation. So James recognizes uh, the fact that people who are going through difficult times tend to face the particular temptation of questioning God's motives, to believe, um, even if we don't actually say it or admit it, that God is, is harming uh, us, has maybe abandoned us, or maybe even hates us. And um, this way of thinking makes us particularly subject to temptation. Um, those, uh, to those habitually sinful ways of dealing with life. And in this section of his letter, James has some really important things to say about temptation and uh, its connection to our understanding, our picture of, of God. Um, so I want to talk about basically just two things here in this passage. One is our experience of temptation, and the other is uh, about our picture of God. So um, theologically, people have tried to deal with the idea of sin. Um, you know, the questions, are we, are we good people who fall into trouble? Are we completely uh, broken and evil people in whom there's, there's nothing good at all? Uh, what is what is actually the situation? Why do we sin? Why do we do those things that we, we say that we don't want to do and we, we do them anyway? What is actually happening? Uh, James um, gives us a description here um, that is um, really really does speak to our our the issue of our experience of sin. Um, and he uses some words here that I just uh, are, are really, if, if, if we pay attention to the words that James uses and the images that James uses, because he's, he's going to paint a picture in words, it really becomes quite powerful. So uh, let's begin by saying this. James says, <laughs> um, God is not tempting us. God is not harming us. God does not hate us. God is not abandoning us. Um, and, and I think we need to acknowledge, you know, James says this, 
Uh, he says, God is, God is not tempted by evil. God doesn't do evil. God is not evil. Um, that that's, seems like a pretty obvious thing, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that despite um, all of our understanding and our theology, uh, we are prone to believe evil of God. And that tendency is seen all the way back in Genesis 3, when human beings fall to the suggestion that God is somehow withholding good from them, um, doing something to, to keep good from them, that God has his own motives and his own purposes that are hidden and they're not necessarily great for us. Uh, and no matter how good your theology is, no matter how spiritual you are, we all have a natural tendency to distrust God. And this is where James begins. God is never tempted to do evil. God does not tempt. God does not hate us or harm anyone. We need to recognize this natural tendency in ourselves and to push back against it. Because our view, our picture of who God is, deeply affects and impacts the way that we live, the way that we understand life, the way that we react to things. It can, it can either harm us or it can help us. Um, so we need, to, we need to think about, we're going to talk about that a little bit as we move in to the later section. But it's interesting to note that, that James surrounds this, um, this picture of temptation that he's going to talk about with, on the one hand, the statement that God does not do evil, and on the other hand, the statement of, of God's goodness, right? So do you see the connection there? Those things are deeply connected, what we believe about God and the way that we react to temptation. So um, let's talk about this idea of, of sin and temptation. And I, I want to be sensitive here because some of these words are, are very, they're, they're quite intense. And I, I, and I just, I want to note that. But I also want to say what James is saying here. Um, James uses language uh, that is, um, that almost sounds like a woman who is being ravished uh, and, and taken advantage of. He uses words like dragged away and enticed. Uh, and, and those words lead to this idea of, of conception and birth and, and uh, the idea of this birth becoming full grown and leading to death. It, it, it is a violent and awful picture. But the violence, on the other hand, is done by our own desires. And I, that is so important to see in this, in this passage. It's, it's intense language, but it really captures something of the nature of temptation. Because there is a willfulness about what happens through our own desires. When we have to admit that uh, we, are, we are willful in sin. We are. We don't, it's, sin is not just a mistake that we didn't mean to do. That, and it certainly happens. And we certainly um, are deeply flawed people who do things that when we realize what we've done, we say, oh, you know, sometimes you have those cringeworthy um, moments where you think, what was I think? Why did I, how could I have done that? And sometimes, uh, if, I don't know, if you're like me, <laughs> those moments come back and haunt you. And, uh, I was having a conversation, and maybe this is some comfort, with somebody the other day, and he was and he was saying, "Yeah, those those moments happen, and sometimes they mean they are like deeply disturbing to us." And years later, you talk to the person about it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I don't remember that at all." <laughs> so maybe that's a comfort. But I digress. The point is that sin is not just that kind of, oh, I made a mistake, I didn't mean to do that type of thing. Sin is, if we are truly honest with ourselves, sin is often willful. It is a decision on some level to have our way, to choose selfishness, to do the thing that we want to do, to not look at the consequences of what we're doing, to not think about other people or, or any of that, but simply 
to do as we please. Sin often is that in us. And yet, James also uses these words, this idea of being dragged away and being done against. And it's, it is worth meditating on these ideas of sin dragging us away through obsessive thoughts or compulsive habits or enticing us as the path of least resistance. Uh, that's really worth it's, it's. I encourage you, take some time and sit down with this passage and think about the ways in which your sin has dragged you away. Think about the ways in which your sin has enticed you. Think about the ways in which your sin has has given you um, this this tendency, this this tunnel vision, right? That just becomes this thing that is obsessive. That is, it's all that you think about. Your mind just circles around it. Uh, how angry you are at somebody, or or something that you want, and uh, or some way in which we're discontent, and it and it just becomes this tunnel vision, and it's like nothing else exists until we then begin to act or react on it. Um, sin has that nature. It both willfulness, but also this sense of, of um, attacking us. And both things, both things are true. There's, there is a sense of being acted upon by spiritual evil influence and willfulness. And both these things are true. And the end result is that these things lead us into death, harm, and destructive actions, destructive words, destructive thoughts that we carry around that cause us to act and react in certain ways. And James tells us, he, it, you know, verse, I think it's, let me take a quick look here. Uh, yeah, verse 16 is just dedicated to this one phrase. Dear friends, don't be deceived about this. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by thinking, oh, um, it just drags me away. I have no choice. That's not true. But also don't be deceived about thinking, this is all my choice. And this is just all me. And I just need to straighten myself up. Because that's not true either. We have a spiritual enemy. Don't be deceived about the nature of temptation. Because if we are, we set ourselves up to fall. Now, um, this is just this, it's this brilliant, I think, true, profoundly true picture of the nature of what temptation is in us. But it's connected to our picture of God. And there's a shift that happens in verse 17 where suddenly James begins to, he stops speaking about this um, picture of violation and ravishing, and he suddenly turns to familial language and uses these terms where God is a father who has chosen us and who has given us birth. And rather than dragging us anywhere, God is giving us every good and perfect gift. So he's like this father who just showers gifts on us. And you, you see that elsewhere in Scripture. If you look at, I mean, go to Ephesians 1, where God lavishes the gifts of grace and his favor and his love on, on human beings and uh, shows, you know, it's the gospel, <laughs> shows, shows how much he has done for us to show us the extent to which God has gone to show us his love. It's, it's amazing. And this is what James, this is the picture that he's drawing here. God is this father who is lavishing his love and his favor and his grace on us. And uh, in fact, verses 12 to 18, our book ended by these ideas of, on the one hand, God is one who, who in verse 12, rewards our perseverance with a crown of life. You know, this idea of, uh, you know, of, I always have this unhelpful thought of, of this hat, because, <laughs> you know, the scripture always uses this idea of, you know, the wreath of the, of the, uh, of the, of the victor, but um, the idea of being crowned with, with life, it's, there's mystery in that phrase, and I, I just think it's, 
<laughs> I think it's really, again, worth meditating on. There's something here that's being said about life that will be given to those who persevere through temptation and trial. And it's something that God is going to crown us with life through that, uh, through this struggle. But then on the other hand, it's bookended by this idea in, in verse 18 of being uh, given birth through the words of truth and becoming a first fruits of, of all that God has created. And the point in this shift in language has to do with our picture or our conception of God. You know, those who distrust God are more open to being dragged away by their own sinful desires. Uh, those who come to recognize and trust the nature of God's unchanging love become more resistant to desires that lead them away from life to death. So let's talk about this picture that, that James then paints. Um, God is a gift giver, and the point of, of the temptation in Genesis 3 uh, at the fall of man is that God is accused of withholding that which is good for human beings. And James directly challenges that notion in verse 17 here, where he pictures every good and perfect gift raining down on humanity. Uh, it has rained a lot here. <laughs> You know, we've, we've had way more rain than we usually have. It's just coming down until the ground is soaked and there are puddles and streams are running and it's there's just water, water everywhere, you know. And uh, this is the picture that James is giving of God as a gift giver. And uh, God, who is this father of the heavenly lights, it's the name that's an obvious reference to the, the moon and the sun and the stars, uh, but it suggests that God is one who, along with the natural gifts of things like food and life and on all of creation, is also raining down on us graces like insight and illumination and truth. And James calls us to begin to recognize and see that God is constantly giving us these gifts. You know, and, and James, uh, you know, other teachers in the history of the church have picked up on this. So St. Ignatius, in his teachings, emphasized the importance of recognizing and appreciating the gifts of God. He, he, he had a practice called uh, examine. And part of this practice was, you know, you, you sit down and you pray for God to help you to remember your day in, in a gracious way. And you then you go back and you remember through your day. And one of the things that you look for are the gifts of that God has given you through things people have said to you, through situations, through things that came to your mind and heart during the day, uh, you know, a, a walk you had that where you sensed the presence of God or, or were joyful. Uh, but gratefulness was something that for Ignatius was so important that he considered uh, the greatest sin that, that we could do to be ungratefulness because gratefulness was this recognition of the gifts that God is always giving. Gratefulness and a recognition of the gifts of God is, is something that can change our entire orientation to life and our entire understanding of who God is to us. God is a gift giver. God is also one who gives us birth and life through the words of truth. Tem temptation, on the one hand, uh, here is, uh, here again, uh, James, is, this is a direct <laughs> confrontation James is making. Temptation is a lie. It is, it is, it is a lie that leads us towards death. It, it births death in us. That's how James puts it. And in contrast, James describes the words of truth as birthing life in us, um, using the images both of birth and harvest in verse 18, the, the first fruits, the harvest, the beginning of the harvest. Um, you know, and so birth, that word is used twice in this passage, once very negatively, uh, the birth of death, and once very positively. God's words in Scripture, um, God's words given to us in prayer, if, if we're willing to listen, 
are capable of producing not just a better understanding of life or, or a spirituality in us, but a new and vital life in us. You know, think about these images that James uses. And this happens, again, as we meditate on the scriptures and we try to hear and understand what God is saying to us through the scriptures. It's, it's when I take scripture personally. When I see scripture as something, as a way in which God is speaking directly to me. And I understand it that way. And I read the scripture and I say, all right, God, what are you saying to me in James about temptation? You know, I, I know there's temptation in my life. I know the situations where I have fallen. I know my sin. Uh, I should, <laughs> it really helps to know yourself when you come to scripture. If I, if I know myself and I see what scripture is saying, I'm more likely to really understand that scripture is speaking very directly to my heart because that's what scripture is about. It's not about good theological understandings. Those are great. But scripture is a book that speaks directly to the heart. And uh, that is an important way of, of understanding your faith and understanding the scriptures. So when we take the scriptures personally, uh, James tells us that God is giving us uh, birth through these words. He's creating something in us, uh, a harvest through these words. And this is God's great desire, is this harvest. God is, God is like this father, and he's like this farmer at the same time. He's desiring to grow something in us that is life. He's not desiring to destroy us through temptation and then sit back and say, huh, you know, too bad for you. Uh, I was throwing these tests at you to see how you do, taking my hands off, just leaving you on your own, and you failed, and that's just all on you. That is not who God is. So these ideas, again, are so connected and they are so important to understand together. That temptation enslaves us, it drags us away, it entices us, it ravishes us, it does against us, it does us harm, it brings death to us. And we cannot resist temptation if our view of God is negative, as one who is against us. We will fall, and we will our thoughts will be harmful, our words will be harmful, our actions will be destructive. So I want to give, as we close, um, a word of pastoral advice, because uh, this, this sermon feels very personal, um, and I, I have talked with many of you about issues that you struggle with, and, uh, you know, we all... We all struggle with sin. So I please understand I'm not, this pastoral advice is not just for you, it's for me as well. This is pastoral advice that I follow in my own uh, struggle with sin. Uh, and so that's why I'm passing it on to you. Uh, so sin is addictive in nature. Um, and we find ourselves not just, you know, sinning one time or oh, oops, I fell and I did that. But we find ourselves in patterns of sin. And we find ourselves in long-standing patterns of sin. And those patterns are not just your actions. They are your thoughts. They are the words that you say to yourself and the words that I say to myself. They are the ways that we come to understand ourselves. Sin is as much a way that we come to understand and speak to ourselves and think as it is the actions that we do and the words that we say. So if you find yourself in a pattern or a habit of sin and, and having been dragged away and enticed by, by sin, God's desire is not to leave you there, uh, but to deliver you and, and to deliver me. And this feels impossible to us when we have long-standing habits of sin. If you have some long-standing habit, habit of sin and you're very aware of it and you have struggled with it and felt like you've gotten nowhere, it feels impossible. It feels like you will never be free. Um, it feels like no one else is struggling with this but you. 
And it feels like uh, God has really just kind of abandoned you to it and is waiting for you to get your act together on your own and fix it before he's willing to really help you in any way. Those are lies. All of those are lies. We all are struggling with this. God is not taking his hands off us. Uh, the truth is, <laughs> we are so caught up in our own minds, we often are not coming to God and when we desperately need to. So it does feel impossible. And often, part of the problem is we want to find an instant solution that is going to free us from longstanding habits immediately. And that just is not... Yeah, okay, maybe that happens sometimes in some people's lives. But generally speaking, that is not going to be a normal experience. Um, but just as falling into habitual sin is a process of being dragged away and enticed, Deliverance from habitual sin is also a process, and it is a process that begins with prayer. And I don't mean prayer like, you know, uh, okay, well, I have to say certain prayers in certain ways at certain times, and then God will, God will come in and help. It really is this uh, conversation about myself to God, and it is, it is this deep honesty and um, it is this process, um, and it should begin with honest confession um, of our, our habits and our struggle with God, how we feel about them, how we feel about our failure, how we feel about our struggle, uh, how frustrated we are, how angry we are. God already knows this, but God when you talk to a friend, they already know a lot of things about you, but they still want you to talk to them, right? So God wants to talk about these things. As you are honest in your confession, and I encourage you to be brutally honest, um, but also compassionate with yourself. Um, but as we do this, we need to be asking God to lead us out of this habit of sin. And, and again, this will often feel impossible, but at the same time, God will begin to give us ways to resist and to turn from sin. And that it's not, you know, three steps to never sinning again. It is, it is this process of repentance, and it's a long process. Um, struggling against sin as we are able, and there are going to be times when we're not able and we fall. And that is just, that is the reality. That is the reality of life. I mean, we come, sin breaks us down and brings us to the place where we have to acknowledge that we, uh, spiritually, are people who fail many times. And that's just part of our reality. Uh, but repentance, though it is a long process, if, if we have any interest or desire or movement in that direction, we need to understand that this is one of those gifts that God has showered on us. It is a gift. Repentance is a gift. If you have repentance, you should be so grateful because God is giving that to you. And if God is giving that to you, then that suggests that God is for you and not against you. And so that should be encouraging. And most of all, um, when people struggle when you and I struggle with long-standing sin, there is this tendency to self-hatred and self-condemnation and despair. Reject those. Those are not going to be helpful. They are not what God wants. They are not of the Holy Spirit. They are, uh, the one who hates you is your enemy, your spiritual enemy. Those are his words. Those are the way that he speaks to us. Don't, do not give yourself to those types of words. Um, do not give yourself to condemnation. Reject those things. Uh, there's a ten tendency to punish ourselves before we come to God. Don't do that. Christ died and desires you to come to him, even with all your failing, even when you are failing, even in the midst of your failing. Christ wants you to come to him. Even, you know, you think, oh, God, I could never, no. This is, Christ wants you to come to him. There is grace. There can be grace even in the midst of your failing. 
there can be turning if if you're willing. Christ is willing. Um, Christ desires us to come to him with our failing and to be received like the prodigal son. Arms wide open to receive us. And, and when we sin, that is the time when we need to go to Christ and find forgiveness and favor and help. A lot of people feel like, I've done this, I can't go to God. No, that is exactly what you need to do. That's exactly what God wants us to do in our failure, to come to him. Right then. To receive favor, not after you've kicked yourself for a while, but right then. Temptation and our distorted desires, along with our, descent, our tendency to distrust God, are all part of the reality of this life. And our distorted desires can drag us away and give birth to death in us. We can, we can either cooperate or resist. Uh, there's a, you know, it's both true. We are willful. We are being done upon. But God wants to give us the gift of life and to create a harvest of righteousness and joy and peace in us, a crown of life. And so I encourage you, as you think about temptation, as you think about these things uh, this week, and think about the ways, sit down with this passage. You know, I've preached it to you. I've opened the, I've opened the door for you. We're, we're not done here. Sit down with this passage. Look at those words. Take them personally. Hear God speaking to you through it.